OK, um, it's one o'clock on my computer. So look, thank you everybody for coming to this um, webinar um, and giving up your um, Friday lunchtime. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet today, the Larrakia people, and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and um, especially extend that respect to um, any uh, Indigenous First Nations people who may um, be online for this webinar. So for those who um, don't know me, um, my name is Peggy Chung. I'm the Executive Director of NT WorkSafe. Um, and in that role, I also um, hold the position of the Electrical Safety Regulator for the purpose of the Electrical Safety Legislation that came into force on 1 July this year. So this webinar is um, put in uh, as part of what WorkSafe tries and promote as the um, Electrical Safety Week or fortnight um, in September. Um, we have followed Queensland um, who has um, extended the week to the fortnight because everyone's very busy and it's very difficult to cram everything into um, one week. Um, it is a celebration of the electrical industry. Um, and so I hope you've all had a nice week and it's Friday um, and uh, hopefully an enjoyable and relaxing weekend coming up. So moving along, um, oops, um, okay, so what I'm hoping to cover in this information session today is um, talk briefly about the compliance requirements um, uh, and highlight the specific um, changes um, that uh, has come into effect as a result of the Electrical Safety Act um, commencing on 1 July this year, as well as um, the um, accompanying electrical safety regulations. So what is set out on this slide is what I hope to cover. Um, it is not exhaustive. Um, unfortunately, there is not enough time for that, um, but it is to hopefully give you an idea of um, what is um, coming, what has come in, what you may need to be aware of, and what um, may um, specifically um, be relevant to your um, practice, industry and um, work environment. So the three main topics is um, compliance requirements um, uh, and all uh, electrical workers and contractors out there probably eat, sleep and dream AS3000 and its uh, relevant standards. Um, and then I'd like to touch on the um, compliance and enforcement powers. These are largely very um, new. Um, didn't exist in the prior Electric Electricity Reform Act, um, which um, was replaced by the new legislation. Um, and um, there is a Electrical Safety Board, as well as some discipline um, matters for a committee as appropriate. Um, the purpose of this is to um, try and, and, and enforce or assure compliance with the Act, safe electrical work, um, and that there are minimal uh, injuries or damage to property um, and um, an oversight by the regulator about um, what's happening in the electrical industry and how that can be um, better managed or better um, assisted in terms of um, compliance and safety. So, I keep tapping on the wrong. Okay, and compliance and wiring rules is the first topic. And in there, um, I will touch upon supervision of apprentices because there are new provisions there, um, both in terms of the act and the regulation and for electrical contractors, um, unrestricted um, and restricted electrical work license holders. If you are supervising someone um, for the purpose of um, getting them up to speed, you will need to be aware of these changes. So in terms of why, um, just a bit of quick background, why do we require compliance with the electrical safety legislation? Obviously, the main or the most important is to ensure the safety of anybody who has um, who comes into con uh, contact with or um, has or work in the electrical 
industry. Um, preventing injuries or death from electricity is paramount um, for the purpose of the Act and certainly um, for my focus. Um, and as part of that, of course, um, preventing property damage or destruction um, is also uh, a, an important focus, but saving lives and preventing injuries is probably the main focus. Um, you may all have heard on the news at various states and the territories, and the NT is no different from that, about um, fires or damage um, arising from electrical um, installations, electrical faults possibly. So the purpose is to try and minimize, eliminate them or minimize that as much as um, possible. Um, and um, also to um, set up um, or set out uh, and establish appropriate standards um, for electrical workers um, to make sure that they stay safe as well. Um, so in that context, um, the legislation um, uh, talks about in detail electrical safety duties. There's multiple of them, depending on the area of electrical work you're involved in. Um, and for example, if you're designing installation or if you're manufacturing, um, there are uh, specific duties that applies to those type of work, but they all have the central um, core element um, that is reflected in the primary duty. So PCBUs for um, those who don't know, of course, are persons conducting a business or undertaking, um, um, employers, um, organizations, electrical workers, electrical contractors. Um, and um, so as uh, those sort of organization in running of your business, um, you have to ensure that um, the work that you do, uh, th that your staff do, and the services you provide is um, safe from electrical risk. I've listed in there um, that the duties includes particular items um, uh, uh, relating to electrical equipment. Um, if you're going to use that, you may need to make sure that the electrical equipment is safe from electrical risk. Um, people say, well, what is an electrical risk? That is anything that would lead to injury, death to a person, or uh, likely to cause damage to um, property. Uh, so that is a very broad definition of electrical risk. Anything that may give rise to um, those um, unwanted consequences is seen as electrical risk. So if you are working with um, uh, electrical equipment, you need to make sure that they are valid and don't sort of crash and burn, as it were. Um, and obviously, any um, work that you do, that the way that you carry out the work is so, so important and needs to be free from electrical risk. Um, and um, there's a specific one for any exposure to um, electrical equipment, uh, such as conductor or component that may be dangerous. So that's just a highlight. There is, as I said, multiple other specific duties in the Act for different um, parts of the electrical industry. There are um, two specific duties that I would like to highlight for um, the, the industry um, and, and uh, anybody else who uh, may be dialed in. So there is a duty to report electrical events in the legislation. That, um, there is a notification form. Um, it uh, is being developed, but if it's not up there yet, it will be soon on our website. Um, there is a duty uh, to report electrical events. Um, and there are two types of electrical events in the Act. A serious electrical event um, involves electrical equipment where a person is killed, um, clearly, or where a person receives a shock uh, and receives treatment, or if they have received a shock from high voltage, um, then that is still a reportable event, whether or not treatment was um, required or uh, provided to the person who has been injured. So um, it, these are mandatory uh, reporting requirements. Um, so if you are aware or if you've been involved in that incident um, and uh, the, you don't report it, there are consequences um, or is a breach of the requirement of the Act. Um, as I said, there are um, also a secondary um, 
probably seen as a la less serious electrical event. They're called um, a dangerous electrical event. These usually do not involve um, injury to a person. Um, so a person um, who may not be safe because um, the work that you're doing or the equipment or you are do you are using may uh, give that person an electrical shock or injury um, is class cl characterized as an as a dangerous electrical event um, where there is significant property damage from electricity that's also a dangerous event or if you know that uh, a, a electrical work is being performed by an unauthorized or um, unlicensed person that is a dangerous electrical event if you know of this then um, you need to report that to NT WorkSafe um, and um, the last one is performing work that um, may lead to a person or property being at risk of damage or injury so those two again are um, uh, highlights um, in terms of what you need to be aware of in terms with respect to the duty to um, notify of electrical events. Um, the other duty that I wanted to highlight is at the bottom of the slide. If an electrical event, um, a serious or a dangerous electrical event occurs as the person conducting the business or undertaking or the electrical worker on site um, that maybe have control or management of the work site, um, you also have a duty to preserve those sites where the electrical event has occurred until um, an inspector from WorkSafe directs you to do so otherwise. Um, why that um, is a requirement is it, it allows um, WorkSafe to um, have a, a direct and, and immediate access or if we can't get there immediately but in a reasonable time um, to actually see the site where it happened um, and, and take whatever information um, can be from what has occurred um, without it being changed or um, removed. Obviously, if you need to um, uh, move things around for the safety of people um, and, and property, then you can do so, but generally uh, the duty to preserve the sites um, uh, is a duty where a dangerous or a serious electrical event has occurred. So they're the two particular duties I wanted to draw your attention to. Um, and um, I've also very quickly um, tried to um, give an oversight, uh, an overview of what is considered electrical work. It's a very wide definition. It's probably intended to be that, to try and capture as much as possible um, uh, in terms of what uh, electrical work is and what the duty to take care um, and to make sure that the work you do is safe from electrical risks is applied to. Um, in the um, Act, there is also a, a very large <laughs> section which provides what is not electrical work um, so that the wideness of the electrical work definition hopefully is helped by the fact that, well, um, if you are working around electrical equipment, some um, type of work is not considered electrical work. That's not to say that you don't take care when doing them, but um, they don't fall within that definition. Um, I don't think it would surprise any of you. Of course, electrical work is connecting electricity supply, wiring to electrical equipment or disconnecting that supply. It also, of course, include the manufacture, construction, installation, removal, etc., 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 of electrical equipment or an electrical installation. Um, doesn't involve, involve work. I've only given two examples there. There are many others under Section 9, uh, Subsection 2 of the Electrical Safety Act, if you are interested. Um, but it really is when, you know, uh, the, the, the work is simple, such as, you know, um, fixing a flexible cord to a power socket, to a socket outlet, or working on non-electrical component of an electrical equipment, you know. Uh, so it's um, trying to um, identify work where you may not be directly exposed to um, electricity or energised um, electrical equipment. 
Uh, I've also very quickly talked, uh, looked at electrical installation work, um, and that's um, where um, you are testing, repairing, or maintaining electrical equipment in an installation or electrical electric line work, and that of course um, deals with um, usually would deal with life energized um, type work and electricity. So um, that sort of uh, class is slightly higher risk in terms of the works that you do. Now, in terms of electrical work, as I said, you need to comply with um, what's in the Act. So the Act requires that a person who conducts electrical work must comply with the wiring rules. Wiring rules are AS3000 um, and um, AS3000 2018 deals specifically with electrical installations. So these wiring rules um, specify uh, what is required um, in terms of your electrical work when you're doing designing, um, construction, um, or verification and confirmation of electrical installations. They set out the minimum safety requirements for a, an electrical installation, and they also um, set out compliant work methods and installation practices. So you, you need to, um, I'm sure all electricians um, or electrical workers in this industry um, probably, as I said, eat, dream and uh, sleep through AS3000, but um, you need to be fully aware of what's required under those rules. Um, there is um, additional requirements in the Act. So any um, additional requirement that may be prescribed by the regulator, which is me, I can tell you now I haven't prescribe any additional requirement, but you must also um, comply with other, any other requirements by the transmission or distribution network, such as your power and water um, or any other um, uh, uh, electrical, electrical supply um, network that um, say you must, um, if, if you're doing work around um, that grid, um, comply with what they um, require you to do, as well as the um, wiring rules. Okay. Uh, I also, sorry, if I might just go back one, in relation to the um, wiring rules, they of course also set out um, uh, and require compliance with the standards um, that apply for electrical work. And it's the standard that is applicable, applicable at the time of the electrical work, because obviously you will be familiar standards to get updated. And so you need to make sure too that you are at the right or, or the correct um, uh, standards or, or that apply at that particular time. Uh, supervision of apprentices. So um, this is a topic that is um, uh, ha ha was um, quite um, uh, not difficult, but was quite wide ranging when um, we were doing the electrical safety regulations. Um, so previous to the current legislation, um, the supervision of apprentice was required on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, and as you may all know, effective supervision, of course, allows apprentices to develop knowledge and skills that they need to um, perform electrical work competently and in a safe working environment. Um, and one-on-one um, uh, -on -one, um, supervision was seen to be quite onerous for license holders and supervisors. And um, they were concerned that, of course, as apprentices progress through their apprenticeship, um, with gaining more experience, um, the one-on-one -on -one, um, direct supervision may not be required. So. Um, Effective supervision includes um, or requires supervisors to follow the um, requirements in the um, in the Electrical Safety Act, of course, um, as well as compliance with um, any work health and safety legislation, um, compliance with the relevant standards, and um, of course, working under a safe system of work. So if you, as an electrical worker, have an, uh, have an apprentice, there is a duty on supervisors to um, make sure that you supervise your apprentice appropriately. So in the current legislation, um, in particular in the regulations, um, the so prescribed level of supervision is very much task-based. 
um, and requires you to, as supervisor, consider the type of work that you're asking your apprentices to do um, and what is the risk associated with that work, such as, you know, um, what is it, uh, the nature of the task? Is it a new installation, existing installation? How risky is that work for someone who is new or not so new to that task? Um, where that work is being performed may also affect the risk and safety um, requirements for that work. Um, mining um, operations um, may be more uh, uh, risky than what you may do in a residential. Um, obviously, if you're working on a ground floor it, that may seem that would appear to me to be safer than if you were working on a roof um, at height um, and also of course um, if the task to be performed is um, involves energized or live electrical treatment uh, equipment that's also a particular consideration you need to have regard to as a supervisor um, and um, the voltage and potential fault, faulty current levels is something you as supervisors would be um, um, more experienced with um, and would need to take that into account when considering what supervision you provide. So the supervision ratios that is provided for in our current legislation, um, the direct supervision is one, one to one, so no more, no more than one apprentice to one supervisor at a time. Uh, there's a general uh, supervision that's broken down to two levels, level one, which is a one to three ratio, and level two, which is a one to five ratio. Um, and people have said, well, how do we decide where our apprentices uh, are at any one time? There is some guidance in table one. That's not the whole table. I've just taken a a, a, a snip of the table just to show you um, what it looks like um, and also be aware that it's not so much time dependent. The timing there in terms of the months are an indication. What you actually need to look at is um, has the apprentice actually completed their studies? What work have they done in the past or to date? Um, and if, if you're in doubt, then go back to direct supervision because one on one's always the best, um, not always efficient or effective. But you can see that obviously, you know, new apprentice who's done very little requires your direct um, supervision. And obviously, if the tasks such as maintaining troubleshooting or report, report repairing faults um, with low uh, with voltage or uh, type equipment, um, that um, the direct supervision requirements goes a, a lot longer in that apprenticeship. And um, you know, if you've got an apprentice about to finish or in the last year have done everything and they are ready to go then you know they would generally come under the you know um, more more apprentice to supervisor general level two supervision so um, again I I've said this a number of times it's a task-based assessment you need to be confident and you need to as supervisors be able to see ah that's what they can do that's what they can't do and then you will then decide what level of supervision um, you provide to your apprentices, okay? Not one size fits all, unfortunately. Um, different apprentices, different um, uh, timing in their apprenticeship and um, different aptitude as well, of course. So um, please be aware of that. Um, you know, we, we want all our apprentices and trainees to finish and become um, elect uh, licensed electrical uh, workers um, to help out in the local industry, of course. So that was all I was going to say about part one. Um, I was going to move now to the compliance and enforcement powers under the new legislation. Uh, this is a new one. Um, for those who um, in the work health and safety uh, legislation space, improvement notices will be quite um, uh, familiar to you. But in um, the Electrical Safety Act, um, it, there is now provision for our inspectors to issue improvement notices. Um, this, the, the criteria is similar to what is in the work health and safety um, area. So um, an inspector uh, may issue to, uh, uh, no improvement notice to a person uh, if they believe that um, 
the work um, that they've done um, has not been compliant with the Act or has contravened the Act or, pardon me, likely to continue to contravene um, the provisions of the Act. Um, and they can issue an improvement notice um, and the notice will set out um, a number of things. Um, it's usually in, it's, it's always a written notice um, requiring a re to remedy, not rectification, that's another term that's coming up, um, to, rect to remedy the contravention um, and, and to um, make good in effect the things, the circumstances or conduct that has led to the um, contravention or the fault that's been um, noted by the inspector. So into, if you get a notice improvement notice, then it will contain the grounds um, for why it's been issued. Um, it will also um, set out the sections of the Act uh, legislation or the regulations, mostly the Act, that has been contravened or we say has been contravened, um, a, a summary, a very brief summary of the facts of the contravention, what was observed, and then it usually will set out a period of time um, for the person um, to fix the problem, as it were. Um, and um, inspectors do have the power to grant an extension of time um, to remedy the um, contravention if more time is required um, and um, a person who receives a improvement notice is required to comply. Uh, failure to comply is, uh, is a breach of the Act and um, I, oh, sorry, I've seen a question there. Can I come back to that once I finish? Um, Peter will remind me. Sorry, on a roll at the moment. Um, I will come back to you. Um, so it's um, if you fail to comply with an improvement notice, um, uh, you may be uh, issued with infringement notice or if um, the contravention is serious enough, the regulator may well um, look at a prosecution rather than um, an infringement. So improvement notice is a new thing. So you will see, well, hopefully you won't see that, but um, if you do, um, then... Um, what you what is expected is that um, the contravention or what's not right be put right. Um, in, a, in addition, there's also a non-disturbant notice um, under the new legislation, uh, very similar to that duty to preserve site where an electrical event has happened. But this is where even in even if there isn't been an electrical event, a serious or dangerous electrical event, an inspector may issue a non-disturbant notice. Um, and um, they may well, um, for the purpose of um, investigating um, or obtaining evidence or just carrying out further inquiries into what happened at a workplace. So um, the non-disturbance notice, again, um, I've broken up this into two bits. It's just to let you know then um, the notice will be a particular form you receive. It will set up the grounds why you are getting that notice, again, what you have to do as a result of that notice, um, and it may well also um, provide um, suggestions or measures that you can do to preserve the site. Um, and the period of a non-disturbant notice um, is seven days is the maximum time because having regard to, you know, you're probably doing a business uh, and operations have to be ongoing. Um, the maximum, there's a maximum penalty for con contravening that notice. Um, there's also an ability for the regulator to extend the non-disturbant notice, but no more than um, seven days each time. Um, it, it's certainly not uh, my intention to, you know, uh, require a non-disturbant notice to go on forever, but um, the seven days is to try and facilitate um, the, the organisation's um, work while um, we are still able to look into any um, issues surrounding that site. 
This is uh, uh, another um, new enforcement or compliance measures. Um, it's a direction to rectify. Um, this power rests with me as a regulator. Um, I can, of course, delegate that power, but at the moment um, it is I um, who can, acting on um, reasonable advice and grounds, um, issue a direction for rectification um, so that um, if I am persuaded um, or if I'm of the view that some electrical work has been performed that's not safe um, or that the person who performed that work has done it poorly, um, negligently or incompetently, and the work um, that is there was likely to cause um, uh, injury to uh, an individual or property, then I can provide a written notice um, to the person um, set, uh, requiring that they rectify the electrical work. Again, I have to provide the grounds for that direction of um, why it's being made, uh, provide supporting information so people understand why it's being done, um, and then um, inviting people um, as to why the direction shouldn't be made. So it's like... Um, Look, uh, it's like a show cause letter um, in terms of I say, well, this I'm a concern. This is what I propose to do, um, it, and uh, we'll provide you a time of at least 10, 10 days um, to respond as to why I should or should not do it. Um, so, it, it why the show cause provision is there is um, we accept is quite a a draconian or quite a harsh direction because basically you'll say you have to do or I'm saying you have to do this so this is um, giving the person who may receive such a notice uh, a, 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 an opportunity to expel to explain or to respond or to say to me look you've got it all wrong um, it's all good um, and you don't know what you're talking about so um, which of course I will consider and take into account as to whether I actually um, proceed to um, formally issue the rectification direction. Uh, there's also um, electrical safety directions. These again are powers that lie with the inspectors. Um, and again, um, that this electrical safety directions are exercised when an inspector believes that there's an immediate electrical risk at a particular place um, so that um, an inspector may attend, see somebody doing work and think, oh my God, that's dangerous because there's no precautions um, and they may immediately um, ask that the activity stop um, and that um, or and that, that it not be restarted um, or engaged in until um, some further actions is taken. It can also, they can also be used to, or these directions can also be used to um, prevent the use of any unsafe um, electrical equipment. Um, and the di a direction can also be provided um, in any other terms, which um, is reasonable, um, for the person to um, prevent the risk from happening. So it is quite wide, um, but it is another um, means whereby hopefully uh, won't be required a lot, but it is to um, ensure the um, level compliance and safety of electrical work that's being performed um, in any instances, in any at any place really. Um, so in terms of the electrical di safety directions, they can be given orally uh, and they must um, provide that information, which is where what I've put there in the, um, in the slide. It can recommend um, particular measures that could be taken um, and then it again must set a time for compliance. It's, it's, it's similar to an improvement notice, but um, I, the electrical safety directions is more related to if an inspector sees an immediate danger um, to something stopping work and then making the um, um, suggestions to remedy the concerns that's been noted, where where's an improvement notice um, allows usually the work to continue, but you have to do more to ensure that um, what is noticed as um, non-compliant becomes compliant. So there is a difference between the notices, um, but it's an added um, compliance measure for inspectors 
um, in this space. Uh, prohibitions, um, don't be afraid, this is not in relation to work, this is in relation to cons consumer electrical equipment. So the electrical safety regulator may um, provide a written notice that uh, prohibit the sale and supply of some of consumer electrical equipment if I'm satisfied that the equipment is not safe or doesn't comply with the requirements of the legislation. Um, I haven't um, had to issue one of these before, so it will um, be quite new for me as well. And, and usually I would be advised by obviously my electrical inspector um, what information is av available in relation to a piece of equipment. Um, and um, it's, um, it's, it's again quite a, a, a significant um, power in that um, the, the stopping the sale and supply of uh, certain equipment will of course impact the seller, the seller and the manufacturer. So I have to be sure that it, it is unsafe before I do so. Um, and um, again, the before issuing the um, prohibition notice, um, I have to inform the public and person affected by the notice namely the seller, the manufacturer, anybody else in between as well. Um, and the notice has to set out um, clearly um, which the, 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 electrical, the electrical equipment that I'm talking about, why it's being um, prohibited, um, uh, what basis I have reached that conclusion that it's not safe. Um, and of course, reference to the legislation as well as any other terms or conditions of the prohibition. Um, I must say, I, I don't see this happening regularly um, or um, at all, hopefully, um, because um, I think um, the consumer electrical equipment um, scheme in, in Australia is really good. If you have the right mark, it's usually safe. So um, hopefully I won't have to use um, prohibitions um, powers under the Act um, anytime soon. Um, and then um, almost finally, there are ministerial notices, codes of practice and recall orders that are also available under the Electrical Safety Act. Um, so our minister, whoever that may be, um, which hopefully we'll know by Tuesday next week, um, may um, issue a notice um, in relation to um, a person's electrical safety duty in relation to a risk, um, we can, oh, I've just noticed a spelling mistake, my apologies. Um, we can, or the minister can direct us to a doctor code of practice relating to um, how a person can fulfill their electrical safety duty. And the minister may also make a recall order in relation to electrical equipment. Um, that uh, recall order is usually made upon my recommendation to the minister to do so. And again, um, the only reason I would do so is, of course, if the um, electrical um, equipment is dangerous and place at risk um, individuals or property. So um, if they're likely to cause um, injury to a person or damage property, then a recall order may be appropriate. So all of those decisions, all of those notices that we've talked about, um, I, I wanted to also let you know that um, the, the Act does provide for uh, avenue of review. So reviewable decisions are um, um, any decisions that are made by inspectors or by me um, under the Act and um, any person affected by the decision of an inspector or myself may apply um, to me uh, for review of that decision. Um, there are um, fairly tight timeframes. Um, if you um, uh, wishes to make an application for review, it has to be um, submitted to WorkSafe within 20 business days after the decision is given. Uh, so four weeks, um, four, four, yeah, four weeks is the usual timeframe, unless of course, um, there's some reason that it's taken you longer. Um, I can allow a later date for that. Um, in that regard, there will be uh, an application for review form on the NTWorksApp website for electrical um, decisions. Um, if not there already, we'll be there soon. Um, again, that's to help you fill in the box and provide the appropriate information um, so that um, 
we can understand um, your concern with any decision and we can review it uh, appropriately. Um, in your application for review, you have to, of course, set out the grounds for why you want the decision reviewed and what facts that you rely on to say that the decision was wrong, inappropriate, incorrect, shouldn't have been um, issued at all. Um, one that I've seen um, that occurs um, uh, not regularly, but has occurred in the past is um, if um, we've referred you to the wrong legislation or the wrong sections, or you disagree with the factual um, background that gave rise to that decision. So the decisions are reviewable, um, but there are, again, processes that you need to follow to do that. Um, just note, though, even if you put in an application for a review of a decision, that doesn't act as a stay on what you're required to do by the notice. So, you know, if you get a, a rectification direction or an improvement notice, um, just because you've submitted review doesn't mean you don't have to comply. You may, of course, um, ask for a stay, but it's not an automatic um, suspension of what you need to do to comply with that notice. So if I, um, when I receive an application for review, I look, uh, I would look at it and I can um, reject an application if I believe it's frivolous or vexatious or there's no grounds, gro no grounds for that application. Um, and um, the Act does uh, require me to respond to reviews um, within 10 business days. So the idea is to get back to you um, or the person that's made the application as quickly as we can, um, two weeks. So, but the important thing to notice is not a stay. So um, it doesn't mean that um, by putting in an application, you don't have to comply with the notice. Okay, home stretch people. Um, a quick um, summary Peggy. of the electrical. Sorry. Sorry, Pete. Uh, before you continue the section, uh, there's still uh, Mitchell's question. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. Let me have a look. Let me have a look. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, is an apprentice under general level two super supervision able to re-energize after repairs or must all works still be checked and signed off by the supervisor? If they're re-energising, I believe that they will still have to be checked off and signed off by the supervisor. Um, uh, my um, policy officer, Cor Corey, you're online. Would you do you have that off the top of your head, or would uh, may I ask you to have a look at that if I'm if I have misunderstood, Corey? I'm sure I saw him there. He's hiding from me. Yeah, no, it's all good. hi Peggy. Can, can hi. You hear me? Um, that's correct. The supervisor will still have to check and sign off. Um, and I think the reference for that is regulation 51 uh, 2B IV. <laughs> that sounds very daunting, Corey, but OK. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll post it in the chat. OK, thank you, Corey. So hopefully, uh, um, is that Matthew? I, I'm just going to call everybody Matthew today. I'm sorry. Um, I hope that that answers your question. Was that it, Peter? I can't see any other ones. Oh, that's all the questions we have for now. Okay. So, um, Electrical Safety Board and Disciplinary Committee. So, um, why do we have a board? Um, so, this is established by the new Act. Um, and um, under the board is a discipline. Discipline Committee. So the board, um, as the electrical safety regulator, I chair the board. Um, the board comprises, um, uh, I think it's, it's eight, eight representatives, pardon me, and um, they are uh, myself, somebody who who will be representing the community, uh, a board member will represent electrical workers, Another board member um, is a, would um, represent the employers of um, electrical workers um, uh, and the chair of the discipline committee is also a board member um, and um, the members of the board is appointed by our minister um, and there's not yet a electrical safety board in place because of our recent election. Uh, we're hoping that once um, post-election 
movements of governments have happened. Um, we could hopefully have an electrical safety board um, appointed or members appointed that board um, realistically by about October. Um, fingers crossed. Um, so under sitting within the board um, is a discipline committee um, that comprises of four members. Um, the chair is a legal practitioner um, with uh, the required years of experience. Again, on the discipline committee, there will be representatives um, from the employer of electrical workers and electrical workers themselves, and then one other board member and um, selected by the board from time to time. And I anticipate that that, that would be a community member or somebody representing the consumer. Um, it's um, my view um, of what would constitute the board. So the functions of the board, of course, um, is to um, develop and maintain the plan for improving electrical safety, um, uh, to advise the minister in relation to electrical safety issues in the territory um, and other juris Australian jurisdictions and abroad. And of course, they also have to respond to any issues that the minister raise. So a minister may refer a particular matter to the board and say, I want you to look at this and advise me about that. And the board's required to respond to um, that as well. Um, so it's a fairly wide ranging type of um, uh, function or requirements under the Act for the board. Um, also, um, to finish off the board functions um, is, of course, to promote electrical safety, um, review the um, effectiveness or otherwise of the uh, legislation and codes of practice and the notices from the minister, um, give advice to the Utilities Commission um, and um, comment on the performance of electrical equipment and finally take disciplinary action through its discipline committee. The discipline committee is again a, a first time um, uh, introduction um, by this new legislation. Um, previously there was the electrical workers and contractors board um, um, but um, that no longer exists. All that's come through to the electrical safety regulator at WorkSafe, as well as the discipline committee. Um, so how, how would you envisage that to work um, in terms of um, issues um, of concerns with electrical work? So for example, um, if you are a, a, a homeowner um, who has contracted with an electrical worker or electrical con contractor for uh, electrical work installing a solar battery. They're the flavour of, um, of the um, decade, I think, um, and you're not happy with that work. You can make a complaint to the um, regulator, to the board in relation to um, electrical workers, contractors, apprentices and trainees. Um, and uh, also include any formal electrical contractors as well as interstate electrical workers working in the NT. So um, the complaint can be about um, performance of the work, um, supervision of the work that was being done, um, provision of um, information by those people um, or provision of um, misleading or false information um, or failing to provide you with documents or notices that's required by electrical um, providers under the Act. So um, upon receiving a complaint, um, uh, I would look at the um, basis of the complaint um, and um, whether or not it is a uh, 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 a complaint that uh, it has merit and, and should be investigated. Um, if I intend to investigate it, then I would advise the parties, the person who has made the complaint, as well as the person complained of, that I intend to investigate the complaint. I would provide information to the person that was complained of for a response. Um, and then depending on what's provided, I'll consider a response from that person. Um, I 
I do not um, um, like to have complaints going on for a long time. So I would set the time frame for the response um, and then set myself a time, a time frame for considering respond and making a determination. Um, and um, there's a number of um, decisions I can make on a complaint. I can find the complaint um, uh, substantiated um, and then I can re refer it to the discipline committee if I think that's appropriate for further action. Um, I, 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 and and um, I am required to then, of course, advise the parties involved in that process of the outcome and provide reasons for um, with what for the decision I've made. Um, I may find the complaint not 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 made out and no further action to be taken, but um, it's intended to be a fairly transparent and um, process and informative um, so that you know people understand why the complaint's been made and. Um, uh, what um, what actions can or should be taken subsequent to um, to a determination. So as I indicated, I can say no further action. Um, I can also give a formal warning um, in relation to the complaint. I can also mediate the complaint between the parties. Um, if I think that's appropriate, I can issue any notice or direction in relation to the complaint. Um, and in certain circumstances, I may consider an enforceable undertaking in relation to the complaint or um, refer that the complaint to the discipline committee for um, disciplinary action. So what does the discipline committee do um, when they receive a referral from me um, of a finding that the complaint's made up? Um, their role is to consider what um, discipline action should be taken as a result of that complaint or that conduct. Um, there's a variety of things that they could do. Um, they can um, recommend to the regulator that the um, person complained of um, lose their license. Um, so that might be a cancellation of their license, or they may uh, suggest that uh, there be a condition put on the electrical license, um, which uh, the regulator can do. They can recommend a suspension of the license for a period of time. So that's not a, a, a cancellation forevermore, as it were, but uh, a suspension of a license um, to allow them maybe to do a course to get more experience or be upskilled in the, in the area where the complaint um, has been made. Um, they can also disqualify or recommend that someone be disqualified from being able to hold license, um, which is um, quite onerous um, because, of course, if, if any of that happened, the top three, it does uh, affect um, the person's livelihood uh, and ability to, you know, an income source, as it were. So I would suspect it's quite a serious thing to um, have your license cancelled, suspended or be disqualified from holding one. Um, the discipline committee can also recommend a reprimand or a caution to be provided to the person or license holders, um, apprentice or, or trainee, um, and they can also require um, uh, remedying the fault or defect. It's a bit like a rectification order. Um, they can also recommend that the person uh, undergo go further training. Um, and um, last but not least, of course, they can impose a financial penalty on the license holder. Um, it's, uh, it's like a fine um, rather than, you know, a penalty going towards the person that uh, made the complaint. So there's a variety of measures that can be um, utilised to um, enforce compliance or, or, or um, in a sense, um, punish um, non-compliance or, or um, concerns um, that um, the electrical work performed is um, non-compliant and, and dangerous. So a lot of um, a lot of food for thought there. OK, so um, that's just an overview and um, that's the end 